Hey all you whiskey fans, today let's talk about Canadian whiskey, but not just any Canadian whiskey, a very, very different Canadian whiskey. And uh, there's some things about the story here which fit into, I think, my story and I really related to, so I had to kind of dive deeper and look into this. Hope you're ready to go through this Canadian whiskey journey with me. Grab a glass, let's dive into it. So what's important is we're not here to talk about just any kind of standard Canadian whiskey. This is a very, very different product. So what I've got here with me is a Macaulay's Distillery, uh, this here uh, production. This is an island Canadian whiskey. This distillery is located in the Greater Victoria, British Columbia, Canadian district. So we're talking way, way over on the West Coast. What's really interesting and special about this distillery is, as you can kind of tell by the bottle, the logos and everything, it has not a lot of like Canadian characteristics. And I was able to taste this and the rest of the lineup at our Multimore Club event. This is a whiskey club in Switzerland. And what this club does is every month they bring in a new importer, distiller, uh, and we try and discover a new whiskey together. You get a little bit of a brief before. I usually don't read too much into it. What I knew is that we're going to be tasting some Canadian whiskey. And because I was doing more and more research and blending, I thought, wow, this is going to be really interesting because Canadians are renowned for their blending. And a lot of their whiskey production kind of processes are very different than the rest of the world. But what they do a very interesting job of is blending. So I came in with this mindset and man, was I wrong. I'm having a peated whiskey here, which is not what I was expecting. Yeah, let's just talk about the distillery. I was so wrong. What was very cool is that this whiskey is being imported into Switzerland by a company called Grape and Grain. As you might imagine, and based off of the name, these are two guys, Matthew and Thomas, which are primarily wine connoisseurs and drinkers. However, they do have a big passion for Scottish whiskey. While visiting Scotland for a kind of an event, they met a guy who knew a guy who lived in Canada and was a ex-Scotsman. So this whiskey here, the Macalonis, is, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, so sorry if I'm not, Macalonis, probably not, uh, is imported into almost all of Europe, however, not Switzerland. So these two guys picked it up and brought it in. Now, very authentically, it's very unique, it's very different. It's won, of course, a bunch of awards. You can go online, even their Irish whiskey has beat out some amazing Irish whiskeys in uh, some different world fairs and whiskey events. Fine, it's a good product, it's worth trying. Now, what's really important for me is, again, hey, I took so many notes and we were blessed by having the founder and distiller himself, Grame Macaloni, actually join us on a video call and show us his still house, a little bit of his back room, but tell us about the whiskey and the products he's making and the why. Now, as you can imagine, you don't just kind of out of nowhere, or usually a good whiskey production does not just wake up out of nowhere and say, hey, I want to get into whiskey. There is a long, long story here about how whiskey was his passion, his history of working in Diageo, what he studied, what he majored and mastered, PhD'd in. It's colorful. You have to visit him, his distillery, and go through his story. You can look at his website too. But it's really interesting. It's something similar that I found when I was getting into the whiskey industry. It's not about the schools you've gone to and the degrees you have. They are pretty much recognized as BS, as bullshit. And yeah, I'm gonna stop there. The other terms get even worse than that. But education is cool. Doing something and actually having that experience is something way different. And this is what Macaloni figured out. Struggling in Scotland, he moved to Canada. He became an expat, kind of similar to me. And he decided, hey, if I can't get hired to work in a distillery, I'm going to open my own distillery. And that's what he did. For funding, they did something also very interesting. They got 700 whiskey enthusiasts from Canada to all become part owners and invest into this 
project. What's amazing here is you don't have one giant company that's just worried about profits. You've got 700 enthusiasts which are interested in a good whiskey. And that being the only ambition I think really speaks to the quality of product and the creativity that they are applying, probably at sometimes a loss financially, but at the end of the day for a good product. They are following the Scottish traditions and the Scottish processes of whiskey production. Don't get it mixed up, they are in Canada. We're calling them a Canadian whiskey because of their geographic location, not because of their style. Kind of similar to how March Distilling is a distillery which is making American styled whiskeys, but in Switzerland. This goes so deep, not with me, but at this distillery that they are actually a Dr. Jim Schwann distillery. Now, for those of you that know Dr. Jim Schwann, many, many very well-known, reputable and large distilleries around the world, it's not just Scotland, of course, in this case, Canada, are made in cooperation with Dr. Jim Swan. He does a whole bunch of things, but essentially as a like real expert in the field, he provides a lot of guidance and supports to different distilleries as they're coming up or as they're changing their processes. He will work with you and figure out, okay, how do I need to ferment? How do I need to distill? How do I need to age? To be able to get very specific products out of your distillate. He is somebody you can spend the hours and hours learning about and you've had a lot of his whiskeys or a lot of whiskeys inspired or matured and cooperated and worked on by him. You just didn't know it. What this means is off the bat, they are taking a education in chemistry, brewing, and expertise in the field to put together this Canadian whiskey. Let's talk a little bit about their production and then we'll jump into their whiskeys. They have two large stills that during the video call we could see as Mr. Macaloni walked around, but you can also see these, these stills on the back of all their bottles. It's imprinted, so as you're looking through the front of the bottle, you actually see it in the back. Really hard to film um, with my lights set up. Uh, I took a picture of it, so I hope you can see it. It's very interesting. And it's a kind of a pretty accurate depiction of what you actually see at the distillery, which is cool. Now, they have two stills, as you would imagine. They've got one still just for their low wines, and then they have a spirit still, which is actually making their cuts. They are the same exact size stills. Now, dimensions might vary as McKellen's stills. This was done on purpose. The only difference is, of course, McKellen has way more than they do, but the stills are identical in their design. They use specifically brewer's barley in all of their productions uh, for a couple of reasons. A, if you're making a product at masses, like high quantities, using distiller's grain is usually the best. It's optimized for the most yield. Not necessarily the most flavor and uniqueness, but the most yield. If you are ready to opt in and use a little bit less efficient grain, you're gonna increase your flavor. It's a balancing act of what you think your distillery kind of flavor profile and characters are. It's the same that we do. We opt for brewery grains because I feel like you get a little bit more out of it. Not efficiency, not production, but richness and flavor. Milling is in the Scottish style, mashing is in the Scottish style, nothing crazy different here. Where things start to change is the length of time they use in their fermentation. Almost every large distillery in the world is working around a one to two day fermentation time. They are doing three days because in their eyes, they feel that it adds more complexity into their fermentation. I tend to agree with that. My fermentations are also longer. This all means they are an artful distillery. They are not just pumping out production for real quick gains. They have longer fermentation times, 50% longer. They are using not the most efficient grains. All of this equates to a product made of love and passion, not necessarily here to make a dime. To add on top of this, they opt for a very slow distillation. They take very clean cuts, and he took it one step further to define cuts. I mean, I think we all know what cuts are. As you are distilling, uh, a product, your mash, whatever, whatever it is, it could be rum, it could be gin, it could be whiskey, but you then decide at one point, hey, I want to keep this amount of heads, this amount of tails, and of course the hearts being the main thing is what you're keeping, but it's up to a distillery to decide when do I make these steps? When do I say, hey, I'm gonna keep this amount of whiskey and I'm gonna throw away this first piece, throw away or reuse, and then same with the last piece. 
These are essentially the cuts. And this is where your distillate starts to take some unique flavors. Usually the cleaner cuts you take, the more pure your product is, maybe the less rich flavors you have, but the more refined, it usually tends not to need to be aged as long either. You can probably get away with just a couple of years aging versus a dirtier cut whiskey more heads, more tails would be aged for longer. I tend to be on the dirtier side of whiskeys. Again, I like more complex, more robust whiskeys. And this usually happens in the later processes or in kind of bigger cuts. Here, they're taking very, very fine cuts. Again, he defined it and how he defined it was quite interesting. So narrow cuts. This is, there's no kind of like fixed rule here. It's kind of like a rule of thumb plus minus. It's something like this. But he's mentioned that Diageo mentions narrow cuts as anywhere between 74%, that's as high as you're distilling off your still or how high you're keeping, to 65% ABV. This means that the moment you hit 64% ABV, you're not keeping that for this spirit run. You're going to reuse that in the next time you're distilling to try to get all that you can out of it. And then he mentions that McKellen takes even narrower cuts and they keep anywhere in the ballpark of 74% and they stop collecting spirits at 69% ABV. That means this is four points before a Diageo narrow cut. Oh, sorry, and I didn't mention their heads cut. They wait roughly in the ballpark of around eight minutes once the still is starting to kind of let product out and then they're starting to make their hearts collect. Interesting, again, I mentioned, uh, why, why did you buy a bottle then? Because you mentioned earlier, you like kind of dirtier cuts. I think that in this case, clean cuts is fine. Why? Because they are doing things like having better grain with more flavor and richness and also longer fermentations, adding more kind of funk in there and more uniqueness that a cleaner cut just doesn't give you a bland, boring spirit. Because of this combination that they've put together, you still get a very unique product at the end. Now, of course, working with Dr. Swan, they are getting access to some of the highest quality barrels that you can get. Whether it's a sherry barrel or another type of barrel, Dr. Schwann is very well renowned, not only for his own method of barrels, well, he will take like a wine barrel that's been used to produce wine or sherry, doesn't really matter, and then rechar the inside, kind of caramelizing and crystallizing some of those other flavors. But he's been in the industry for a long time and he knows all the bodegas and anybody who has any good barrels or uniqueness, he is a great person to help source or get access to them. What's different, however, is they're following the Scottish processes. They're following and using probably similar barrels to that of which might be used in Scotland. In fact, there are similar sherry barrels to what McKellen and Glenn Farkless use. But what's very, very different is the climates. He claims that after four years of maturation, they are losing one third of the quantity of their whiskey. If you're using 100 liter barrels, just to make it simple, that means you're losing around 30 liters, if not more, be around 33 liters of your end product. That's a lot by anyone's standards. What's really interesting about the lineup that we tasted, and one thing I didn't like about it, I'll save to the end, two things kind of, but they're kind of tied together in my opinion, is they have a very, very interesting batch of whiskeys. They peat some of their whiskey themselves, We'll talk about that in a moment. And they have an unpeated lineup of whiskeys as well. These unpeated, now of course they have the Irish one I mentioned earlier, but they also have kind of like their regular single malts, which are not using unmalted barley, but they are very, very well aged. The barrels you can tell are very high quality, very much a bold, unique blending and maturation process as you would expect with Dr. Swan. But what they kind of do on top of that is being a Canadian island distillery, they've kind of kept true to the, let's say, Isla's process and they do produce some peated whiskeys. Now they do two that I was able to taste. They're, they probably do more, but I was able to taste two. One of them is at a lower PPM. I think it was 11 or 15 PPM. And the one that I actually purchased here was 54 PPM. Parts per million in the calculation of how much peat is actually on the grain. They are peating their barley themselves. As I mentioned, they're getting their barley from brewers. Brewers do not historically peat anything. 
So they're doing the peating themselves. What's very cool is if you are familiar with, uh, let's say, American single malt whiskey, there is one distillery which is probably one of the, the longest, I'd say, well-known American single malt distilleries, and that's Westlands. Westlands is a Seattle, Washington company that has access to their own peat. This peat is actually the same peat which is being used at this distillery. In fact, they are very transparent about it. If you actually look at the bottle, you will see that it says right here, Washington peat. I think that's really interesting. It's openness and information that you don't expect. And if you're a large distillery, you probably don't mention that. You might see them as competitors. And their art and what they do, I appreciate that. Hey, you're giving me way more information than I needed. And I'm very, very grateful for it. I mean, same thing on the bottle. You see how much is in there, what day it was bottled on, number of bottles. This is bottle 182 out of 345. And this was cask number 404. Very cool. What I um, will say this before I step on that last point. They have their own ambitions to use their own and get access to their own peat and also to provide their own unique type of peat. They understand that Westland has kind of captured their own niche and their own market with their peat. Islas use their own peat and they wanted to do something similar. And they wanted to kind of show the influence of peat terroir. A term used in wine to show what, or to kind of give an idea of how one region's wine and grapes are different to another's. Peat is the same. It is kind of an organic substance. And it does make sense that based on the different, let's say layers of aging and composing components that you have, that or this will create a different type of smoke and will flavor your grains slightly differently based on the region. So really interesting. I don't know much about this. Sadly, I didn't ask. I should have. But they are doing some experimentation with seaweed peat. I guess that means that probably they had a water source that kind of like they had, let's say you had a river that had access to the ocean where it was almost on the ocean and you had a lot of seaweed after years and years, the seaweed kind of decomposed over itself and became what we would call peat and they've used this to peat their barley. Super interesting. I have no idea what this is gonna taste like. I imagine salty and oceany. I hope not too seaweedy. I don't know if I would like that, but very, very interesting, very different, very unique, and I love the idea. They also found a source of local peat, which by asking, you kind of see a picture of it here, some of their local investors and fans to come and help them dig out. And this peat they've actually used in some of their own production. Sadly, I don't have access to it here in Switzerland, but I hope one day it makes its way over to us. Really interested in tasting it. As I mentioned and kind of hinted on, very cool distillery. I really like what they do. Um, there are some wishes that I have for them. Firstly, the whole batch we were able to taste is 46% ABV. 40 is the limit, the minimum barrier of entry to be considered a whiskey. And you see a lot of distilleries doing 43 and they just do 46. I'm not sure if this is because they find their whiskeys taste the best at 46. However, I find that hard to believe because their entire lineup was all 46% ABV probably has something to do with either this or their clean cuts and their, I mean, these aren't the oldest whiskeys. They're like five to seven years, which I think is more than enough. It's a great whiskey, but uh, it all leads to a kind of smoother and not very rich, long lasting finish. If you had on these a stronger finish in my mind, this would be like world-class whiskey. So I'm really hoping, and after the discussions we had with Matthew and Thomas, there will actually be a higher ABV or barrel strength version coming to Switzerland. I cannot wait to get my hands on it and try it, that this solves that problem and the finish becomes even more amplified because then this would be something I would probably consistently have on my shelf year around and happily drink and pour. I will leave you with this last note as you sip your whiskey. Uh, I mentioned kind of five to seven years. Even that is not accurate for all their whiskeys. What's important is you will never see an age statement on any of their whiskeys, any of the products that they sell. Why is that? Because 
and and I really like this, especially coming from the Americas, he feels, the distillery feels, that there is a level of snobbiness with age. There's arguments for both sides here, but I think there is definitely a community of whiskey fans which are buying whiskey because of the age and how old they are, not because of the quality of the product. And they did not want to play into that game. They wanted to keep kind of what they stand and what they believe to be accurate and true, that a good product with all the right steps and decisions made throughout the process is a good product at the end of the day. It does not matter how old it is. And I tend to agree. Again, coming from a background in American whiskey, it's not necessarily how old the whiskey is that makes it good or bad. It is more the steps and the ingredients that you've taken in creating that product. New barrels, good luck aging that for 20 years. It's probably going to taste like wood. Again, really interested. I loved the talk. I don't go to British Columbia often. If I do, I will need to stop by. This was a distillery that A, makes a great distillate, was very friendly, unbelievable talking and joking with him. And it was, again, a lot of cool experimental whiskeys, a lot of very unique differences. They're not just copying anyone, they're doing things their way. And, and it surprised the crap out of me. Again, was not expecting this Canadian whiskey. I was expecting something very different and I was very happy I was wrong. With that, cheers to you. Your next glass of whiskey, maybe it's Canadian. Maybe it's Macalonis. <laughs> Bye now.